Hello, thank you for being on time. People who are late do so at their own peril. Today is going to be a slightly different day uh, from all of the other days of the course. Uh, this course is very much focused on teaching you all kinds of fancy techniques that are hopefully of use to your data analysis. Um, but in my experience, uh, it's not always that easy to use these techniques. You know, it starts like this, right? People write a paper and they have a beautiful result and it's all published in Nature Neuroscience and it's fantastic and they tell you all you have to do is to write these four lines of code and you know, these are all the steps you need and then off, off to heaven you are. Um, but in reality, more typically, when you try to do this, immediately you discover that you don't actually have this software and that you can't easily install it. And then when you have installed it, it turns out that it doesn't want to load your data. And then when it has loaded your data, you get all these totally obscure errors during processing. And once you discover, so, so solve that, you still get all kinds of weird errors during visualization as well. So um, today I want to talk about solutions. Well, one solution, of course, is to simply pack your bag and leave. Forget about it. But, you know, we're at Caltech, right? We can do it. So what we're going to do today is talk first about uh, different kinds of data that you might have for processing. And we'll talk about how those data are or can be represented in Python. And we'll talk about how to convert between various different data representations. Uh, and when I say we will talk, what I mean is I will talk very, very briefly and then have you work through a notebook. Um, but I will be loading the notebook on my own computer. So I'm gonna break it up in little steps because I really wanna make sure that I'm taking all of you along. What that means, if, if you have a question of any kind, please ask. Because the only dumb question is the question you didn't ask, causing you stare ahead blankly for the next 10 minutes because you have no idea what's going on, right? So, so really, uh, questions are good. The other, uh, Professor Wagner's first law of questions is that if you have a question, you can be pretty sure that there are at least two or three other people in the room who have the same question. That's generally true. All right, so we'll have a first session on, uh, just on data, very abstractly. And then we will talk about uh, going from raw traces or raw recordings from your, well, we'll use electrophysiology as an example. Um, we'll go from raw traces all the way up to sorted spikes because sorted spikes, that is action potentials that have been assigned to particular cells or at least putative cells uh, are often a very good starting point for further analyses. And that'll take us up to lunch. So we're going to take these two things slowly because uh, I really want to make sure that we can understand all sort of the Pythonic steps that are involved. Um, because today is not about product. Many of you will, will never do spike sorting in your life because you may not be doing electrophysiology. But the, the approach that we take of just methodically going through data uh, and understanding all the little in-between steps of the analysis is gonna serve you well for whatever fancy data analysis you do on whatever fancy data you have. So I am pushing the philosophy session until after lunch because we'll all be sleepy after a good lunch from these amazing caterers. And then we'll just sit here and chat a little bit about four questions that I think uh, are pertinent to, well, science in general. After that, uh, we will talk about well, I'm probably going to skip the, the, the spikes and neurons waveform session. Uh, and you can do this at your leisure, or if you are faster at Python, you can probably get to it at some point uh, through the day. And I'll, we'll spend the last hour and a half or so uh, on a particular example of uh, taking sorted spikes and feeding it into some sort of uh, higher level data analysis setup. So again, uh, all of my examples today are going to be focused on electrophysiology. 
Uh, but that really is just by way of example. It applies to everything else. All right. So we'll dive into our first data session right now. And before starting to the notebook, I wanted to quickly introduce two terms. And many of you may have seen these terms, but I just wanted to give you my definitions. So I often distinguish between two rather different kinds of data, time series and point processes. A time series is a continuous or in reality evenly sampled record of a phenomenon, like an audio recording of a singing bird, or uh, the temperature in this room as a function of the day taken measured every minute. Or it, it doesn't have to be zero dimensional like that. It, it, it can also be a movie of animal behavior, in which case at every time point you don't have just a single number, but you have an entire image. Or in our case, very often it can be a voltage trace from one electrode or many electrodes. So this is in contrast to a point process, which is a discontinuous record of a phenomenon. For instance, uh, if you go back to our bird, we might create a list of all the times when the bird started its song. So this will be irregular, right? It, it might sing uh, around daybreak, it might sing every 10 seconds for, for a while, but, but, but not exactly every 10 seconds. So we want to know the exact times. And we're not going to represent this as a whole long line of zeros and occasional ones, which would be a time series, but just as the timestamps themselves. So there are infinitely many examples of, of this that you can come up with as well, uh, like the dates on which temperature records were broken. I think we have a pretty continuous series of that right now. Uh, or snapshots from a red light camera, or very relevant today, uh, a spike train, that is a list of all the times that one particular neuron fired action potentials. Also, this is a good moment to introduce my TA, Frank Land Frankie. Hello, Frank, can you stand up and raise your hand? Frank is a graduate student. Uh, he's actually a Caltech graduate student, uh, although he's detached to Berkeley right now because uh, his lab made the unwise decision to move. Um, he is Isidore Sau. And all of the data that we are working on today were uh, recorded by Frank uh, in the Sau lab. Okay, uh, so I'm going I don't want to spend too much time on this um, because I think a lot of this is sort of familiar territory, but I do want to make sure that that is in fact the case. So uh, if anything is not familiar to anybody, slow me down, right? Because uh, today is very much process, not product. That's a term I learned from preschool. Uh, it doesn't matter at the end of the day uh, the results that we get out of our data analysis. You know, I'm, I'm gonna throw that Google Drive away tomorrow. What matters is that uh, you have thoroughly absorbed the process that we're taking today to do the analysis, so that hopefully uh, you can incorporate some of those ideas, some of those very general uh, philosophies almost, into your own work. All right, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to just get started. Uh, so from the perspective from a computer, a time series is really just a list of numbers. And you can store lists of numbers inside your computer in many different kinds of containers. The simplest in Python is simply called a list. Oh, if I double click on things here, then fancy stuff happens. Uh, so you can make a list simply by naming a variable and putting the things that you want in that list in square brackets. Or you can make a list in fancier ways, algorithmically, uh, by putting an expression in and saying what the value of x should be in that expression uh, to construct your list. So when you're programming in, uh, in Colab or in Python in general, when you issue a command like this, you usually get no report at all. So you don't know whether it worked. So I always like to create an extra cell and then just type A and see what it looks like. And Colab is occasionally extremely slow, but you know, sure enough, it has understood that we plunked all those numbers in a list. 
did you put it in a list? Yeah, sorry. You can ask, what is the type of A? What, 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 what does Python thinks that A is? Well, A is a list. Oh, I should actually pres preserve all this for posterity. Let me not overwrite my cells, okay? Uh, and since it's a list, I can simply ask, so, so what is the second element of the list? The second element of the list is 0.04. Ah, we learned that Python considers this the zeroth element of the list, so we have to make sure to remember to count from zero. What's B? B is also a list. Those numbers look pretty messed up. I thought that, you know, if I take uh, one and divide it by 10 and, and take this computer square of it, I should get 0 0.01. Python thinks it's 0 0.01002. Well, do we care? No, we don't. Uh, computers store numbers in finite precision. And so from its perspective, this number here is just the same as 0 0.01. And the piece of software in Colab that, that prints these things decides to give us all the digits, even though we cannot possibly care about all of them, because that very last digit we have here actually demonstrated conclusively doesn't mean anything. All right, so that's a list. A good thing about a list is that you can uh, add additional content to that. For instance, here we're showing uh, how you uh, can add a single number, append a single number to it. Here, look, A now contains the number 0.36 as well because he appended to it. And you can also uh, glue lists together in the example that I just showed you. So now we have the numbers going up a little bit farther as well. But the bad thing about lists is that you can't do math with them. In particular, just, you know, adding a plus B, if A and B are lists, does not do what you think. Try it. Does that make any sense? So to me, this makes absolutely zero sense. I understand what the computer does. What it's doing is it's appending the two lists together. But in my mind, appending two, two lists is not a reasonable way of implementing addition. I would say you can't add two lists together. Even in English, you can say, I can add an item to a bag, but I cannot add a list to a list. If I add a list to a list, I have two lists in, in my head, right? So I, I would like to have expressed this differently. If I, if I were to write a computer programming language, I would probably have invented a new uh, operator. Maybe I would have invented something like that, you know, or uh, that. But writing that just like it is normal edition, I find very confusing. So I, I'm, I'm belaboring this point um, because uh, it turns out that it matters what kind of container type you have in Python. If you have a list and you write A plus B, you get surprising results. If you have some of the other types that we will be discussing in a minute, it works just fine. Uh, so unfortunately, you usually can't get away with not knowing the container type of uh, your data. So again, it is very often very convenient to just ask, what do we have? What is A? Ah, A is a list. All right, so we have a uh, tiny little exercise for you that I will let you work on for a few minutes. Uh, take a list, let's take our list A, multiply all the numbers inside the list by 10 and stuff it into a new list that we will call X. So I'll let you have a few minutes to, uh, to do this. It's going to be very easy for some of you, and it's going to be not easy for some of you. That's all good. Uh, you might want to work in pairs. And I will write one or a couple solutions in a minute. So uh, I'm going to write one solution, and there are plenty ways that you could do this. So one way to do it is to start defining x as an empty list, and then go for i in the range of the length of the list a. Just add, oops, uh, add to x. The corresponding number to from a, except that we wanted it 10x. Okay? 
that runs without bugs. And now we look at X. And sure enough, we get 10 times the numbers. If we are willing to accept the fact that you know 0 0.899999999 is Python's funny way of saying 0 0.9. Is that the only way you could write this? No, of course not. There's many other ways. So for instance, you could have written x is nothing for a value in a, x will depend 10 times v. Same result. Exactly identical. Or you know, if you uh, want to be really fancy, you can use a list comprehension. You can say 10 times v for v and a. That works too. Does anybody have a solution that is sort of interestingly different from these three? It's a pretty straightforward exercise, so there's only so many ways you can do it. Well, now that we have learned how to do this, maybe this is a useful thing. Maybe we want to not forget this. Uh, so I'm going to make a little function that's called 10 times a. And then I'm going to say a return. And I figured out how to do it really fast, so I can write it now in one line of code. Silly little function. This function by itself does nothing, right? Uh, if, I, if I ask what is 10 times, it will tell you it's a function. Utterly boring beast. But now I can ask what is 10 times, oops, so I have to actually type it, 10 times a, and I get a number. But I can also put in our, our previous famous, uh, well, let's, let's, let's use b, put 10 times b, then it calculates, does that same math on another variable. So if you have a calculation that works for you, and you're going to be using it on other data, Leaving it as a raw code snippet like this uh, is often not ideal because then you have to step through your notebook again and again, uh, mucking up the stuff that goes before, uh, and you get very confused about what data you've analyzed. It is very often very convenient to uh, sort of encapsulate a useful bit of code uh, in what is called a function so that you can then apply that function to any piece of data in the future. Now, this is admittedly a, a very silly example because, you know, this is just a line of code and the function call itself is hardly any longer than this. Um, but, or sorry, hardly any shorter than, than just writing the silly thing out. But of course, in many cases, it wouldn't be like that. And the other advantage is that uh, if you do your job well, you can give your function a name that you can remember. And you can also write a line of comment that says uh, 10 times uh, returns an array, sorry, a list. Uh, no, well, I'll say that takes a list and of numbers and produces a new list of numbers, each of which is 10 times the value of the corresponding number in the input list, right? So uh, you can write yourself a little bit of comment. Uh, and the next time when you read your code, you don't have to try to understand what this funny little piece of idiom meant because you can actually read in plain English what it's supposed to do. And then when you've read it in plain English, you can understand, ah, yeah, that looks like it's doing that. And you can check that it's true. So I like functions a lot. Okay, so this is still a little bit painful, right? If we want to say 10 times the numbers of A, we now have this function 10 times, but next time we maybe want to do 12 times or we want to take the, you know, the square root of the numbers. Uh, and we don't want to write functions for each of those operations. Uh, so there are data structures in Python that you can use to encapsulate numbers in a better way that uh, recognize, bless you, that uh, these things that are inside your structure are in fact numbers. Because Python doesn't know that the, that the things that are in a list, uh, let me say one more thing about list before we move on. Python doesn't know that the things that are in a list are numbers. You know, you can put, uh, 
a cat in the list, or the fact that something is true, or you can put, uh, I don't know, what else can you put in a list? You can put another list in the list. Here, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put a little list of, 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 of tiny little sequence in the list. All right, so now I have a list that has three items. The first item is the word cat. The second is uh, the Pythonic notion of, of truth. And the third item is itself a list that happens to have four items inside it. So, so lists are very generic, uh, which is why you can't do uh, arithmetic on list because who knows what it means to multiply a cat by 10. Um, all right, so the, the next useful strategy for storing data is called a numpy array. And you can uh, initialize it just by stuffing a list inside of it, and then it converts it to an array. Uh, you can also uh, create numpy arrays uh, in more ar arithmetic terms. So, so what this says is I'm taking the range of all the numbers between 0 and 0 0.6 in steps of 0.1, not including 0.6 itself, uh, and I'm taking the square of those. And now uh, I actually can do arithmetic on these things. So let's first show that this worked. Y is indeed the array. It tells you that it's an array. If I ask for what the type is of Y, it will tell us that, I wish that this would scroll a little bit smarter, that it's an MP array. Python sometimes uses slightly obscure language, like it's called is a numpy nd array. I think that means that it can be an n-dimensional array. So this is a one-dimensional array, it's just a list of numbers, but it could have been a matrix or an arbitrary tensor with uh, you know, a cube of data or, or, or some uh, hypercube of data, as, as long as, as, it's, as, as it's dense. So it can be three by four, it can be three by seven by uh, 80, 83,000. Uh, but there's no missing data in that thing. So, so every, every row of your data has the same number of columns. All right, uh, so likewise, the type of Z is also an NumPy array, I hope. Yeah, uh, Z itself is as advertised. In this case, all the numbers came out beautifully without 0 0.000001s. And indeed, when I did the addition, it added it the way a sane human person would treat that, right? You can add two vectors, and when we add two vectors, we mean we add the x coordinates of the vectors, we add the y coordinates of the vectors, etc. We don't mean that we now suddenly have a six dimensional monster. I have a quick question. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll give you one example. So, I mean, obviously you can't picture a four-dimensional thing in your head, at least I can't. Uh, so what I tend to do is I sort of downgrade the dimensions in my head. Say that I have a three-dimensional uh, array in my head. I can picture that as a sequence of two-dimensional arrays. So I can go in my head very flexibly between sort of a, a cube of data and a line of squares of data. And so if I want to think of a four-dimensional data structure, I can think of that as a line of cubes. And then I don't try to picture what that looks like in this fourth dimension because of course, I, you know, we are three-dimensional creatures, so we, we don't readily have that. Um, but l let's say that you have, I mean, give an example of four-dimensional data that you might encounter. Okay, so we, we might have a, a number of cells, a number of mice, a number of uh, behaviors. behaviors, and a number of time points. Time points, a repetition, and so on. Repetitions, et cetera. Okay, so th this is a very good example of, in this case, a five-dimensional data set. Uh, 
it's probably not going to be stored this way because it's unlikely that the number of cells is going to be exactly the same for all of the mice. Uh, so in practice, you might use a slightly different uh, storage medium here. So let's take the mouse out for a second because uh, the mouse complicates things. But still, this is a four-dimensional data set. Cells by behaviors, by times, by repetition. This happens all the time. Uh, so you can really easily visualize this as, you know, uh, cell by behavior, by time, by repetitions, for instance. So you can break it up in your head to become lower dimensional. Also, uh, because this isn't image data, right? The, the, the four axes in, in uh, this example are fundamentally unrelated to each other. So maybe you don't even really need to visualize it uh, as a four dimensional thing. Maybe you can just sort of keep it in your, in your head as, okay, this is a table and I can index it in different ways. But you can definitely do this. Or, or you know, may, maybe it is more natural to think about it as uh, C by B by T by R. Or you can also flip the axes around. It's, it's, it's entirely possible to, to, to turn this into maybe, maybe C by R by, you know, B by T is the way you want to think about it. Yeah. The, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, there are advantages to different representations, uh, and I will get to that in a minute. So uh, hold on to your question. I'm, I'm going to just write down to remind myself that I not, should not forget to address it, because I don't think it's literally in here. All right. Uh, so this, by the way, is very often how I uh, annotate my data. I will, I will invent a letter that I can easily associate with one of my dimensions, uh, just a single letter. And I use capitals to indicate how many of it I have. So C, capital C means the number of cells. Num capital B means the number of behaviors. Capital T means the number of time points. And then I use little t to iterate across them. All right, so what do we do if we have lots of time series? So, uh, for instance, here, here's a really dumb example. Uh, fictive temperatures recorded over the past couple of days uh, in three cities. Well, one thing I can do is store them into a, a dictionary. Uh, a dictionary, or Python calls it a dict, is basically a bag that is labeled items. So in this bag, these, these squirrely brackets uh, indicate that it's a bag. Uh, there is an item, this, that uh, is labeled by the, by the word LA. There's an item, that, that is labeled by the word San Francisco, and there's a, uh, you see it. Uh, you can't do math on this, not straightforwardly at least. So, b because again, these are lists. Uh, oh, we, we, I should do the usual thing, so we can say the type of temps is indeed a dict, and temps itself we can show, it will oops, uh, happily tell you what that all is, and I can ask for one of them, for instance, the temperatures in Fargo, and it will give you the answers. But if I try to do the temperatures in Fargo minus the temperatures in uh, Los Angeles, I get an error. You can't subtract two lists from each other. It doesn't know how to do that. So that's another reason why I don't like the use of plus for list addition, because you know if you can do plus between two things, you ought to be able to do minus between those two things. OK, um, so it becomes slightly nicer if we store them as arrays inside that bag. Now you do that. See how good your visual memory is. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> 
Okay, so I have a bonus question. Why is this a very silly thing to say, apart from the typo? Why is this line of code that I just wrote a completely silly thing to write? Okay, yeah, I, I, I could absolutely have written that uh, in the equivalent. Uh, I could have written it like this, in fact, for instance. Uh, think I don't think that yeah look that's working why is this silly well because the sum of two temperatures is not a temperature the difference between two temperatures means something but the sum of two temperatures is a completely meaningless physical construct anyway so uh, what I mean to say is that not everything that you can do in data analysis is actually worth doing Okay, um, so. What if you wanted the mean, if you wanted to calculate the mean temperature of a continent as the integral of the sum of all the temperatures, what would that be? Well, that is meaningful. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, you can absolutely use this as an intermediate step towards something that means something. Uh, no quibbles there. Uh, but, yeah, of course. Um, well, if you convert your temperatures to Kelvins and then you can add them all up because they then are sort of like a kinetic energy. Yeah, but then it makes more sense even to talk about energy in the first place because when we think of temperature, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give it to you, sure. Uh, now, the beauty of Python is that it's a full-scale computer language. So if you have already done this, ah, done this, you don't need to type it again. You can do uh, this sort of thing. And it constructs the array for you. Now I want you to look at this line of code here because that looks like absolute magic. And this is called a, a Python calls this a comprehension, which I find it an odd term. I don't quite know why it's called that. Um, but it's an incredibly useful technique. So we, we did it before. I'm just going to scroll back to our various ways of, of constructing the, uh, the 10x list. We constructed the list by just saying this. And this is, this is almost the same as the math expression. You know, uh, we, we construct a set x where x in, I don't know, something, uh, in the real numbers, uh, in, sorry, in the, in the natural numbers. So, so think of it as uh, this sort of expression. And in Python you can do that not just for lists, as shown here, but you can also do it for dictionaries, as shown here, except for a dictionary you always have to have a value, the thing that you stuff in your bag, and a label or a key. So this, in this notation, uh, you can very quickly populate dictionaries. And I, I do this a lot because uh, this one line of code replaces uh, the equivalent of you know, these three lines of code here. And I find it a lot easier to read uh, because well, largely because it, it, it makes sure that I don't have to forget to initialize my variable. Because if you forget to initialize your variable in this kind of block, you get really weird errors sometimes. Okay, so a little exercise for you. Which of the three cities had 
the greatest change in temperature. Obviously you can spot it with your naked eye, uh, but can you write a little piece of code to extract that? All right, so who did the exercise in terms of this structure, as I sort of suggested, and who did the exercise in terms of this structure as I had originally intended? Half and half, fantastic. So um, let's try both. So let's first do it uh, in terms of this, okay? I'm gonna say dict style. So one thing I can do is I can say for city, comma temperature in uh, <coughs> temps two dot items. Let's just see if we, if we sort of vaguely understand what's going on here. Look at that. I can extract my keys and my values pairwise and create a little loop that uh, loop that, that, that does something with them. Okay, so now we are looking at changes in temperature. Well, how do we calculate a change in, in the temperature? Well, uh, I'm gonna write this in a new line of code because I wanna do things step by step because otherwise I go nuts. So let's say, if, can we calculate the, the changes? Does that look right? LA stepped up and up and a little bit down. Up and up and a little bit down. Yeah, fantastic. All right, so now I can already see it with the naked eye. The largest change in temperature. What do we mean by that? Do we mean the most positive or do we mean the largest absolute change? I think I want to have the absolute change actually. So let's update our code one more time and say the absolute change Does that work? It works fantastic. All right, so now we want to have the largest absolute change. I think that what I meant by that, hmm, do we mean on average across the days or the greatest that we've ever seen? Well, I think I'm gonna intend, I'm, I'm gonna mean the greatest that we've ever seen. So I'm just gonna say mp.max around that. All right, so here's our answer. The answer is Fargo. Now I could of course have um, extended my data analysis further and written my code so that it just only spits out the word Fargo. Um, and that would be a perfectly rational answer to this question. However, in my experience, if you do something that is even slightly less trivial than this, you're going to encounter bugs. And so if you only spit out the answer, you're not gonna know whether that answer is correct because your computer will have done something other than what you intended. It's exactly, it's, it's sort of annoying, back to grade school, show your work, you know. Um, but it really is like that. You have to show yourself your work because otherwise you get in trouble. All right, so um, now let's try the, so, so this is if we're working on dicts, right? But we also tried this style. So let's go below all of this and, and now for the labeled arrays style. Okay, so we have now, we have a list of cities And we have a list of, uh, what did we put? Did we put it in temps two? What, what do we call it? No, sorry. We just called it temps, okay. So now this is a uh, numpy array. So we can do things on this directly. We can say, okay, let's calculate the difference of the temps and let's see what numpy does with that. Wow, in one fell swoop, it does the whole thing. So apparently NumPy is smart enough to take that difference in that dimension rather than vertically or in some, something else. Now, in all fairness, you could have asked it to calculate the difference in that direction. 
and that does not do what I expected. I have, that did not do what I expected. So we need to educate ourselves. You can always educate yourself by saying something, question mark, and hitting enter, and you will get a help text, which is often a little bit difficult to read, um, but it is worth getting to know the lingo. So I can, at this point in my life, read this pretty quickly and see that there is actually three parameters to diff. Only the first one is required. The first one is the thing that we want to know the difference of. And then there's two more. The second one says the number of times values are differenced if zero the input is returned as is. So that to me is a pretty obscure way of uh, saying what it's trying to say, but I think what it's trying to say is that I, if I do, let me create a new line of code, mp.diff of temps comma two, I'm gonna expect that this is the same now as mp.diff of mp.diff of temps. I think that's what they're trying to say. Yeah, that's what they're trying to say. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being deliberately a little bit boneheaded here, right? Uh, I, very often you come across documentation that you don't quite understand. And when that happens, again, you can do two things. You can pack up and leave, or you can uh, roll up your sleeves and just play a little bit. The beautiful thing of computer code is that it won't die on you. You know, if you have a, if you have a biology prep on your bench, you can't just spend an hour playing around. Your protocol will not allow it. Uh, and you're, even if it did, uh, you probably are not going to uh, be very happy because bad stuff will happen to your poor leech, right? Uh, but the computer is endlessly patient. So if there's something that's a little bit weird, uh, check it out. All right, so now there's the third dimension, axis, which is the axis along which the difference is taken, the default is the last axis. So this explains why it worked, because the default is to do it in this horizontal last axis of the two. But I could have done it like that. So let's see what happens when I do that. mp.diff temps comma axis is zero. That's the first axis. All right, question for the audience. What that, does that number mean in our world? Does it have a meaning at all? Very good. That's the difference between LA and San Francisco on the first day. Is that obvious? No. Would you ever write code like this? Well, you probably should avoid it because it is pretty obscure uh, and it requires a real thought. But this, excuse me, is a perfectly rational thing. So now we can go ahead and do our same thing. We can take the absolute value of that. Still works. And we can take the max of that. Ew, not good. We just get a single number out. That was not what we wanted. We wanted to have the per city max. Well, again, let's educate ourselves. Max also has a help text, and it says you need to put something in that uh, you get the maximum of, and then there's an axis variable. Axis is none, ha. Huh. So that's the axis along which to operate. By default, flattened input is used. So that is uh, Python speak for saying by default, you just take the whole thing and calculate the maximum over the whole thing. But we can absolutely do the maximum I'm just going to create one new cell, mp.max of mp.apps, mp.diff, temps, comma, axis is one. And now we want to have the maximum over axis is one again. Does that feel right? Yeah, that does feel right. Uh, it's confusing because Python has taken our little 2D array and convert it into a 1D vector and put the numbers all side by side. 
but that is definitely right. And now if I put the cities, I, I can actually do that. I can just say, uh, let's say this, okay, uh, max dt is, I'm putting it in a vector, let's say max dt just to make sure that we know where it is. And now I can write for city, comma, uh, dt in zip of cities, comma, max dt, print city, comma, dt. And we get the same result as before. Now, I want to emphasize that there's nothing right about one approach or the other, right? Uh, in fact, I kind of dislike this approach because it's very easy to lose track of the correspondence between items here and those cities. Because look what would have happened if in one final cell before we move on, I had taken the max in the other direction. Uh, oh, I don't have to stuff that in very well. I can just do that. I also get three numbers because it happened to be that we had four days and so there are three differences. So our array of differences is three by three and it is super easy to lose track which dimension was the cities and which dimension was the days. So I really don't like this approach. Uh, I often use the dictionary approach, but there is a cooler approach, which is called a data frame. And I'm gonna close these two help texts so that my window stops scrolling around. Ah, no, uh, zip. Zip is one of many generators uh, which takes inputs that uh, are matched to each other and uh, iterates through them. So what, what Zip does is it takes two or three or you know 15,000 uh, lists or, or things that can be treated as lists. And if you use it in this four style construction, it outputs in each iteration one item from that and one item from that in corresponding order. So it's a very convenient way to, if you know that two things are belong to each other, for instance, a, a list of names and a list of, I don't know, uh, ages, uh, you can zip through them together uh, and go in one go. You, you could have easily written this like this for, N, for I in a range len of cities print cities i comma max dt i. It's precisely the same result. Uh, but once you know this, I find this easier to read. So again, it's a choice. You know, if you don't find this easier to read, by all means write this or whatever you do, you find easier to read, yes. Oh, that's because I screwed up my max dt, thank you. I have to re reconstruct my max dt. Thank you very much. This brings up a point that I wanted to make. Um, you know, I had this line of code here that said max dt is. So I try to never do that. Uh, if I have a variable that gets defined in some earlier block, I really, really try to avoid defining it later. Because if you define a variable or if you change a variable in two different places, and then you decide that there is a mistake and you want to do something else in a block that's in between, you get exactly the kind of bug that you, that you discovered that I had just committed. Really bad, do not reuse names. This, I mean, this is particularly bad in notebooks where you have a tendency to jump back up and down uh, in, 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 in the ways of data analysis. Um, I want to postpone that into the, uh, into the philosophy section. I think this is a really good question to discuss, but let's do it after lunch. 
All right, uh, I'm using way too much time on this, but it's okay. Uh, so there's another way that you can store the temperatures, which is in a data frame, which is actually a really cool way of, of storing uh, complicated data. And it has the great advantage that it maintains labels in this super nice manner. And it really maintains labels because you can say, ah, that was not helpful, go away, here. Because you can say things like temperatures in LA and it will give you the list and it still has remembered that these are the temperatures in LA. Uh, so, so data frames, among many other things, are a good way to not lose track of your labels. Um, right now, I'm coming back to your question about long formats. So there's another way that you could represent this data, also in a data frame, which looks like this. Uh, you have one row for each measurement. And inside the row, you record not only the measurement, but also which day it was and which city it was. Now this gets to be really long, um, but it has the immense advantage that let's say that you don't have a Tuesday reading for LA. You can just leave this line out and the data structure is intact. Whereas in this structure, you have to put something there. Now maybe you put a zero there or you know a 999 or a not a number or something, you can think about it. Uh, but whatever you do, you'll, you're going to have to communicate that to your future you uh, because you'll get very confused. Um, this construction has the enormous advantage that it is very straightforward to ask yourself, what was the average temperature on Monday? Let me see if I can do this without embarrassing myself. Temps, oh dear, uh, pd.where. Does anybody know how to actually do this? Maybe I can say temps, I think I can do this this way. Uh, oh God, temps day is Monday. Does this work? Temps two, ah, thank you. Right, so now I can, now I have this data structure and then I can go on well, let, let's let's do, let's break this up a little bit, okay? Okay, uh, T Monday is that, and then I'm going to say uh, T average of Monday is T Monday temp dot mean. Seems to work. Let's see if that worked. Fantastic. Right, so, so, so this is really, really expressive. Uh, it's not very intuitive to me because I very rarely use it, but if you spend the time to do this for a couple of days, you will find this kind of expressions very intuitive and it feels almost like writing English rather than writing some sort of computer languages with for and range and zip and blah, blah, blah. All right, um, I wanted to go back to the other question that we had uh, I'm going to skip this exercise, I think. Yeah, so, so we already discussed this, right? We created this cities by days arrays, but you can also create more complicated arrays of a movie, for instance, or uh, a time by electrode array. And you might want to convert between the two. Uh, I think we're going to see examples of that, so I'm going to skip it for now. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to give you a big warning run this piece of code in your notebook and see if you like the result you see how completely nonsensical that is so why does that happen i can do some really interesting magic to make it go away just change it, not at all. Well, let me put this in a new uh, cell. Uh, 
Whoa. Okay, yeah, and this is all fine. So what happens is that Python, unlike you, cares a lot about whether a number is an integer or a floating point number. If it's a floating point number, it feels free to, you know, add 0 0.00001 to it. If it's an integer, it's going to stay exactly that number. But there's a problem. Computers have finite amount of memory and they try to use it wisely. And so when you put an integer into Python, it assumes that that number is not larger than 2 to the power 63, which is about 10 to the power 19. And if it is larger than that, wild stuff happens. It doesn't return an error, but it just creates a negative number or a small number that is completely different from what should be the right thing. So the bottom line is if you see this sort of things happening, if you expect to see big positive numbers and you find unexpected zeros or bizarre negative numbers, uh, very often this is the problem. And all that you need to do to get rid of the problem is to somehow force Python to treat it as a floating point number. Because in floating point number, uh, Python can uh, tolerate much larger values. So in this case, the numbers go up to, to a number with 23 zeros in it. Uh, it. Python can easily deal with 200 zeros. So if you see this, do something like that. Oops, uh, except you don't, shouldn't probably break your code. Now, if you think that 100, that, uh, that 10 to the power 19 is a big number and that you're not going to come across this, here's a different way that you could come across it very easily. Imagine that you have 100, 100 million samples in your electrophysiology recording. Well, that's not so much. That's only 30,000 seconds or a couple of hours uh, if you're recording at 30 kilohertz. So this happens all the time in practice. Uh, and if you just take a timestamp in that data set and, and take it to the third power, you're already running into the problem. So see here, these original numbers don't look all that big, perfectly reasonable. But if you take the third power of them, it gets all mucked up. All right, this is an exercise I really do want you to do. And then let's break for uh, 15 minutes. <laughs>